Okay, panelists, can you give me a thumbs up if you're ready to start? Awesome, that's great. Hi, everyone. Great to see you out this wonderful evening. It was a really great sunny day, and um, I'm seeing some uh, some regular um, people from the Vancouver Island that I've met. My name is Michelle Iverson. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for CHFCC, the Community Land Trust, and Como Management Services, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our town hall tonight exclusively for Vancouver Island members with giving you a chance to speak into the meeting and to ask any of your questions to us at this time. If you have any problems, uh, you can see the email on the on the screen there. That is um, Debbie's email. Plus, I did talk a little bit about the audio. You can call that number as well. So I'll turn it over to our CEO, um, Tom Armstrong. And as soon as I get the slide turning, It'll be great. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. We have a smaller uh, group because we wanted to have a bit more of an intimate uh, conversation with uh, members on uh, Vancouver Island. Um, I know that many of you have plugged into the um, webinars and town halls uh, to which we've invited all of our members. Um, but we know that island members uh, do have uh, spe specific concerns um, that um, you sometimes want to uh, connect more with each other, uh, and this uh, should be an opportunity for that. As Michelle said, we uh, are able to um, uh, create a little bit more of an interactive um, uh, platform tonight because of the, the numbers. So hoping that will lead to uh, an exchange uh, between us that will be informative for, uh, for both of us. I did want to begin though um, by acknowledging that um, you, most of you, um, are on the uh, unceded territory of Lekwungen uh, people, uh, the Songhees and the Esquimalt. Uh, over here, we're on the unceded uh, territory of the uh, Squamish, uh, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh uh, First Nations, and we uh, uh, give our uh, thanks and our respect uh, to those who's, uh, who were stewards of this land long before us. Um, so I'm going to ask, um, Michelle, do you have uh, additional information to share with us on how the, the um, the meeting is going to unfold, or is, is Fiona, are you going to take us through those slides? Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Fiona Jackson. You may know me, Member Engagement Communications here at CHFPC. And yeah, before we get started, in case there's an, you've, you're not familiar with this interface, uh, I just want to, we've taken this screenshot of an example of the attendee interface that you will be seeing if you're using a desktop computer or a laptop. Um, you should see a window that will show the presentation contents with video feeds and a window that will show the controls. The control panel has audio settings and a questions chat box. This can be detached and you can move it around your screen and make it bigger if you prefer. You can listen in using your computer speaker system or if you prefer, you can join in over the phone. You just have to select phone call in the audio pane and then the dial in information will be displayed. Um, I think we have another slide. So here you can see that you'll see a questions box on the control panel. And as uh, Tom and Michelle were mentioning, today we're, we're having kind of a fairly intimate group. So we would like you just to indicate that you'd like to ask a question. And that way you can either do that by um, clicking the hand, raising your hand to ask a question, or to just say your name in the question box, and we'll know that you want to ask a question, and we'll unmute you so that you can speak to the group. Um, if you have a question that's specific to your co-op, uh, we are happy to have a conversation about that offline. You can email us at members at chf.bc.ca, or just let us know in the question box that you'd like to discuss something later. If you are having any technical difficulties, however, please do write that up in the questions box and Debbie, who's here with us this today as the uh, technical support, will be able to get back to you and try to troubleshoot that problem. I think we have another slide. So yeah, you should be able to see uh, up at the top all the people and uh, presentation slides below it. You can change with, by grabbing that bar that you can see there, you can change the size of the two relative to each other. Uh, change slides, please. So if you are happening to come into this by a mobile phone, some of you may be, then this is what the screen would look like when you tried to log in. And then the next screen shows you what you should be seeing right now, if, you, if you've logged in okay. You will see um, uh, 
yeah, you'll be able to see the organizer screen, the audio settings, the questions and other settings over there on the right. And then if you next screen, you should be able to see, I think we have one, is that one more screen? Yeah, you can see a question mark down on the bottom. That little question mark is where you can um, type your questions or say your name so that we can unmute you. Um, once the meeting starts, please set your options to screen so you can view the presentation slides. Also, just a heads up that several times this evening, we will be doing polls. It'll be a lot of fun. Uh, but if you're joining by a desktop or a laptop, you're going to want to make sure that you are not in full screen mode, because if you are, um, they don't, the polls won't work correctly. So you just want to make your screen just a, a little bit smaller than the maximum screen size for that. Okay, so we're almost about to get started. So great that uh, we're here we are with you on the island all the way over from Vancouver without having to get on a boat or a plane and really happy to be here. Um, we are going to have a sponsor this evening and our sponsor is Rona. And with us tonight to say a few words about Rona is Brad Legro. And I should let you know that at the end of this meeting, we will be drawing a name and sending um, a draw prize by email to the lucky person from Rona, a gift card from Rona. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Brad to speak to you for a few minutes about the exciting things that are happening on the island. Hi, Brad. Hello, how are you? <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks very much for having me. Um, I just want to quickly talk to you guys about, uh, you know, we had a long standing relationship with uh, CHFBC and we truly value it, um, but there's been some changes and um, most of you probably are aware that Lowe's Canada uh, purchased us in 2016. Uh, we've been undergoing a um, number of changes over the last few years and the most notable for you on the island was the Langford uh, Rona Home and Garden store converted to a Lowe's box store. Um, so uh, our coverage on the island as, as a Rona banner is really not that great. So it's Caldwell Hill and Nanaimo. Um, but the Rona accounts are still active uh, at the Langford store. Um, so the, the way it works is you would go in, make your purchases as you would normally, uh, and just uh, make sure that the contract ser services desk or sales desk knows that you have a Rona account, um, and um, they would pull it up. They do the sale through the low system. Uh, and then what happens is we buy back the receivables and charge it to your account and you'd see an invoice and a statement at the end of the month. So that access is still there um, um, for, for business. Um, now, I have been working with Arnold and we do have the telecom store Lowe's. Uh, we have the Langford one. We have one in Nanaimo now. So the coverage is getting better uh, and we're looking to open up the Lowe's banner uh, to the program, which would give you much more coverage. Uh, and a, a better offering from our group. Um, so there's more information to come on that as we work through that. Um, it's gonna be worked through an app-based system, um, but uh, once we get the details ironed out, uh, you'll see communication coming from us and, and probably through Arnold. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is just the different services um, that we can provide uh, members. And it doesn't have to be in store all the time, it can be project-based. Uh, we're doing lots of renovation projects, um, some on the island, more so in the lower mainland, obviously. Um, uh, it can be kitchens, bathrooms. Um, we offer different uh, services. We're having a lot of success with the dryer vent cleaning, uh, which insurance companies are pushing. And I know um, CHF is also uh, in favor of. Um, we're having a lot of success with that, and the rates are really good. Um, and so we've actually done a bunch uh, already in the Lower Mainland and some on the island. Uh, the services are branched out from just dryer vent to duct cleaning, um, window washing, uh, gutter cleaning, carpet cleaning, uh, and and the rates are really great, uh, especially um, you know as as the units go up, the discount gets gets uh, increases. So you've probably seen a a flyer maybe a couple of times now um, offering that service. Um, so my contact information is at the bottom of the flyer uh, and so is Arnold's. Um, so it's, it's anyways, it's easy. Uh, you just send over uh, an inquiry. We have you fill out a quick sheet, a little bit about the co-op number of units and it's tiered pricing. Um, so I think our top tier pricing is around 30 bucks per, per unit for the dryer vent, uh, which is, is a great rate and that's from inside and outside. 
Um, anyways, that, that's just a, a quick synopsis and um, just want to have a chance to talk to you guys and I appreciate the time and if there's any questions, but by all means, you can ask them now, I suppose, or you can shoot me an email. Sounds good. And we can make sure to make um, share your email address with everyone in case they want to follow up later. Okay, great. Yeah. Any okay. questions? No. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Brad. Thanks yeah, for you're coming. Welcome. Thanks, Brad. Anytime. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Cheers. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. Well, so away we go. Um, again, we're just going to hit some of the high points of the um, uh, some of the topics that were canvassed in earlier town halls. But of course, the um, the pandemic is a very quickly moving um, uh, and very fluid uh, situation. So information that you've seen or heard uh, from our website or other sources uh, has likely changed uh, in the last little while. So let's have a look at um, where the um, uh, the full suite of resources is you'll find this banner on our, our website. You've probably um, uh, checked it out. Uh, from there, we've created a little list um, on the next slide of things that uh, you're likely to want updates on or or to see. Um, we we have more information now that the province is moving uh, into the second phase of its uh, if it's opening or reopening. Um, there are some requirements around uh, safety plans that have impacts for co-op uh, offices and co-op operations. So we're going to canvas uh, a few of those. Uh, there are some uh, impacts on uh, co-op finances, um, and we have some uh, data to share with you and, and some uh, some best practices. And we'll we'll invite your um, your comments on how uh, those um, how, how your finances are or aren't uh, being affected by the pandemic. And of course, we'll remind you of the different uh, government programs and, and forms of assistance that are available uh, both federally and provincially and what's available to you and what's, uh, what's about to run out and what may or may not be um, extended. And one of the very hot topics these days uh, is certainly around the ability and the capacity of, of co-ops to conduct meetings, either at the board or the, uh, the members level. Uh, we're busy, um, busier than we expected to be supporting our members in that area. And we have some, um, some information to share with you, but also we wanna hear from you on, on what uh, your experience has been so far and where you might need uh, some of the support that we have to offer. And then we'll, of course, bring you up to date on our own reopening plans and, and where we've moved uh, different services, how we've uh, worked with our partners uh, to maintain uh, the level of service to you that you've, you've uh, become accustomed to and where we see that going uh, in the next little while. So I suspect that we, um, we might have a, a, a poll coming up uh, soon. I want to get a sense from you of where we might want to focus uh, some of the conversation that we're going to, uh, to have uh, with you. Uh, so let's um, let's see that first uh, poll again. Make sure you're not on full screen mode uh, and just be in a partially. So we want to know where where has the biggest impact been on you? So has it been on your finances, on your maintenance and other operations, on your ability to hold meetings, or on uh, your your community and the bonds you have among uh, members? So we'll wait a, a few seconds. Uh, let you um, uh, answer. You can select one of those and then. In a few seconds, we'll see where the focus might be for you. Okay, so I'll close the poll in just a few seconds. So I'll share the results. Oh, look at that. Okay, so. Um, a little bit surprising, but uh, but good news uh, hasn't had the biggest impact on your finances. That's the data that we're seeing as well, by the way. Uh, so that's consistent. Uh, meetings, uh, three quarters of the respondents uh, think that meetings is the topic and the rest of you, uh, maintenance and other operations. And that's a good thing because I think we're about to um, to slide into that uh, maintenance and other operations section and, and talk about uh, opening, reopening, um, how that affects the you know the management and the operation of your co-op. So let's um, let's move there now. Uh, 
Okay, so is that me, Tom, or? It certainly is. <laughs> okay, hi everybody. Um, I just uh, wanted to share with you some of the best practices and the plans that, that we're putting in place at CHFPC uh, for our uh, flooring and cabinet installations when, when people are going into, into their suites as we hit phase two of BC's re, uh, reopening plan. And also we have a management company, so how our staff are dealing with their members, we thought that would be a good idea to share what they're doing and share some of those resources with our members uh, so that you can sort of know what best practices are. So when, during the first phase, um, everything was um, locked down, so you could not, the co-op office was closed if you had one, and there was definitely no entry into the unit. So there was a lot of cleaning in the common areas, and but now uh, the restrictions are lifting. So people are, uh, we're, we're having to put in place a COVID safety, uh, COVID-19 safety plan for all work sites, and your co-op should also have a COVID-19 safety plan. And I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the things that we're doing. I'm not gonna answer them all, but you may have a direct question uh, as it relates to this particular phase of the COVID-19 and what your, what your role is at the co-op. In fact, we already have one question out there, which is from uh, Pamela about the role of the board, um, what, what role the board should play in the pandemic, whether it's for information, leadership or modeling. And, um, and we will certainly answer that question. I'm gonna to go to you, talk to you a little bit about how people are going into units. So what our, our flooring installers are doing and our tradesmen are doing is before they go into the unit, um, when you send out a notice of, um, that we will be going to the unit, attached to that is a pre-screening assessment. And the assessment is about four or five questions. They're really basic. And we ask people things like, um, have you been in contact with somebody that has been diagnosed for, with, for the coronavirus? Um, are you taking care of somebody that has been, um, has been impacted by the virus? Or have you been traveled? Are you, have you been traveling? Are you supposed to be in quarantine? There's four or five quick questions and we can certainly share those, that questionnaire with you if you wanna use that as your co-op. But the goal is to have the member uh, have those questions before the, the contractor or the unit inspector, or even if it's a, a member of your own co-op that might be doing an inspection of sorts, having that before they go into the unit. So that's one of the best practices that, that we're using. Uh, our preference is that when somebody goes into the unit, regardless of what role they're playing for, for the reason, that the, the unit is unoccupied, so the member vacates the unit. It's, it's safe for the person that's going into the unit, and for the member that's actually living in the unit as well. But we realize that sometimes there's extenuating circumstances and uh, the person may have mobility issues and they can't leave the unit. So in those cases, we try and keep it to a minimum number of people and we make sure that we have physical distancing at all times. So you may have a tradesperson or somebody going in to measure your floors if you're doing an upgrade with your cabinet. And in those cases, what's happening is they're sterilizing the area that, 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 that and the, the people that are coming in your unit will be wearing at a very, at a very minimum uh, booties, um, um, masks, gloves, and they'll be sanitizing the area and sanitizing all their tools. Sometimes we find that um, they have to leave their tools uh, for an extended period of time or why they go for a break or whatever. So we are asking the member in the unit if, if they happen to be there to, to not touch that, those tools and so forth. So these are some of the things that we're doing when it comes to going into the unit. The other thing that I'll talk a little bit about is what happens when you're doing move in, move out inspections. That is definitely uh, something that um, it, it challenges the physical distancing restrictions. So what our staff are doing uh, is they're doing uh, setting up an appointment either with the person that's already living in the unit and they're doing, um, I would call it a FaceTime, but it's kind of a live feed. So it was like, okay, at 10 o'clock, let's get on a call, whether it's a Zoom call or a a WhatsApp call because it's just a one-on-one -on -one person or a FaceTime and walk through with the phone through the unit. And if it's a live call, if you are the, the, the maintenance committee member that is responsible for that particular task, um, you will ask them to, you know, to show you certain areas and so forth. And we also find um, that is really helpful when it comes to showing units because that's another issue where you have to be careful about uh, safety. So you want to show a unit. We don't want to have any vacancy loss. So how is that happening? 
what we are doing is we are having uh, a virtual tour set up. Again, a really easy if you um, have a phone and you just got your video and just do a walkthrough and you save the file and you share the file. It's usually a big video file, so you can maybe share it on a Dropbox um, or a Google Drive and share it and share a copy of the unit showing. And that's one way to do it without having any contact. We have found that some people are still wanting to actually come in and see the unit. And, um, and if that's the case, um, what happens is our staff person would go in, they would open the unit, they would step outside and not go into the unit with the person and then let the person go in. Of course, uh, we would ask that if they have to see it in person, that they're wearing gloves and that they're wearing, wearing a mask. And that's, and that's Sort of, and that's sort of how it's happening. With the member meetings, you still need to have member meetings. We are making a preference that it be on the telephone. It's a lot easier when you have an appointment to take a call for a member meeting. But some co-ops have a really large uh, common room, and um, and they're able to put like two large tables together and have a conversation. Common room is closed off, and there's not a lot of people walking by but you're still able to have a conversation, a confidential conversation with a couple of tables um, uh, stacked um, a longitudinally, and you can have that, that member meeting if that's what's needed. Still, I think a teleconference or a Zoom meeting could, could work, but you've gotta be flexible and see what works. Some people are just um, not as adept with technology, not comfortable with technology, and they're really depending on on their experience, they really want to talk to somebody. So find a way that you can do it um, with a face-to-face -face if that works for you, and if you're comfortable to do so as well. Now, um, a lot of co-ops can will use large trades. Sometimes they use a small subcontractor. Our recommendation is if a trade is coming into your co-op to do whatever, they are also required to have a COVID-19 um, COVID safety plan. So as a board or, uh, or a maintenance committee chair, you should ask them, what is your plan? And make sure that they have one because you're supposed to have one. And once you do that, you should share that information with members to give them assurance that, that this has been um, taken into consideration. So uh, generally the three, the three things that we're suggesting to, to, to boards is one, come up with a plan. Now, depending on your co-op, the plan can be extensive, the, can, the plan could be really short. And I'll go through some things about what a plan might look like. Uh, then once you have a plan, you pass a resolution. So the resolution is be it resolved that the board of X co-op um, approve, approve the COVID-19 plan. And the second part of the resolution is that you commit to updating the plan as the public health guidelines change. So your COVID-19 plan can include some things that I spoke about already, uh, but it might be like, how are you going to hold member meetings from now on until, until we don't need, until that physical distancing res restrictions are, are lifted? How are you going to handle checks, keys? How are you going to show units? What are you going to do for in suite inspections and showings? Um, what about common rooms? What is going to be the rule for common rooms? If you're going to go ahead and book them, what is the occupancy limit? I don't know how many of you may have laundry rooms and you may um, have concerns about the, the space and the physical distancing that. So your COVID-19 plan is really starts with a risk assessment. You get all the directors around the table and you walk through your co-op and say, okay, what are the areas that we need to be concerned about and um, what's going to work? It, there, it isn't a cookie cutter one. You really have to be creative because this is your home, this is your community, and it has to work for, for your members as well. And every, every member profile is different. I did talk a little bit about um, about the COVID-19 um, resources that are available. And um, these are some resources that are online right now. I will say that these are free. So it shouldn't cost you any money. You should just go online, go to the BC Housing website, go to the Workspace BC website, and do start downloading some of those resources. Strong suggestions on signage. Members will need to be reminded um, that there, uh, there are physical distancing restrictions in place, that, um, that there's an occupancy limit in the common room, there's an occupancy limit in the laundry room, um, and other kinds of signs like that. So those are some of the things um, that's happening. So these are some of the resources. Again, we'll put this up on our website. 
and um, and I'll see if there's any questions. Uh, Tom, are you back online? I'm just wondering if we should uh, take questions now or at the end. I, I am back. I, I did want to um, answer the earlier question. Um, yeah. That was, you know, what is the role of the the board uh, in this um, in this situation? And it's a great question because it highlights uh, the very special um, nature of the board's relationship to the co-op and and the members. So, in a situation like this, um, members will have their own views on what's good for them, um, what's good for the community, and uh, and they're entitled to. Um, to act on those views uh, as shareholders in the in the co-op, the board, however, is obliged to uh, take into account and act uh, wholly in the best interests of the co-op. So, when it comes time to to create the plans uh, that Michelle has just um, you know laid out some of the key elements uh, of, uh, the board actually has a legal obligation not not only because there are directives from the provincial health officer. But because of the nature of uh, directors who are elected to govern co-op associations, uh, they're obliged to uh, act honestly and in good faith and in the best interests of the co-op. And in a situation like this, it's hard to imagine that that doesn't uh, involve making sure that plans are in place to protect the health and safety of members uh, of the broader community and of uh, tradespeople or uh, consultants or managers uh, or others uh, who are going to have occasion to interact uh, with uh, the co-op and, and its members? So that's why some of those uh, uh, some of those considerations uh, that Michelle outlined fall solely and directly on the board's uh, plate. Now, of course, it's important to have conversations about these things with your members, but when it comes time to actually make a decision, um, you know, what is the risk and what's the best way to mitigate that risk? That is an obligation that falls squarely on the shoulders of the directors who are elected to to govern the co-op. Great. I'm just going to read um, the other questions that we have there. It's that they did talk about the poll that the most challenging was the meetings, but what were the other? What were the other two? The the other 25% was from the maintenance and other operations. So 75% saying ability to hold meetings and 25% uh, maintenance and other um, operations. And the other question um, coming out there is. Uh, what are co-ops doing when they're not getting any information from their board? Um, other than one notice at the start regarding issue, the issue of housing charges and being isolated. So there's not a lot of communication coming from the board. Well, there, um, well, I think there are two parts to that answer. One is that you need to, um, you need to be persistent. I mean, you shouldn't have to be, but you need to be persistent in, in pressing the board uh, for information. Um, you know this this is this is uh, an unprecedented uh, situation but it's also an opportunity for uh, leaders to lead uh, and and to to you know take charge of a situation in a way that acts to the benefit of members so i'll say that first that this it is the board's responsibility to act in the best interest of the co-op and and if you have a board that is not doing that then you're entitled to ask why not and and press them to assume the responsibilities they've been given now Having said that, we are extremely fortunate uh, here in BC. If you compare the um, uh, the performance of our public health authorities and our government to some of the outcomes you're seeing in other provinces and other countries, um, you know, to the south of us and around the world, but even you know, just to to keep it to Canada and compare those impacts, our public health authorities are doing a magnificent job. So some of the uh, the links to the resources that you saw on an earlier slide, and, and by the way, we'll make all of um, these slides and a recording of the uh, event available to you. Um, those, those sources are being updated uh, sometimes by the hour uh, and certainly every day. So you can uh, make yourselves, um, make, make a habit of checking in on those um, resources because they also come with uh, frequently asked questions. So uh, if you have questions about what's safe to do in your community, um, you know, how many people can gather at the same time? Um, what's um, what's within the, the, you know, the second phase of the reopening and what has to wait until that uh, third phase? All those questions are available through the government uh, website and they're very uh, ably answered. But again, it's a combination of, uh, you know, needing to 
insist that your board step up and uh, take its responsibility seriously, but also to make uh, make use of those public resources because they're they're there and they're very good. Great, thanks, Tom. Um, so uh, these are what you're seeing on screen right now is where you would find all the resources. I did talk a little bit about some of the things in the plan, so we're happy to share that. That would be there, and also the questionnaire before people go into units. We've uh, we've done we've done all the legwork, and we're happy to share those kind of resources to make it a bit easier. So we're going to go over to you now, Tom, um, for uh, for finances. Yeah, well, let me just check in perhaps with um, <clears throat> with another poll just to to check and see how um, how things are going. Uh, we want to. Um, uh, look more concretely at the impact uh, that this has had perhaps on, on revenue collection. So, so let's have a look at that. Uh, I want to ask you to gauge for us the, um, the impact on uh, co-op revenue. So here, here are those questions. So since the onset of COVID, our housing charge revenue has uh, remained roughly the same fallen by less than 15 percent fallen by more than 15 percent so have a look at that and enter your best educated guess on the answer okay we're probably ready to go uh, yes, we have um, closing the poll and sharing the results. There you go. So this, as I said, very consistent with um, with what we've been seeing, uh, and and we have a fairly uh, large sample of the co-op portfolio uh, through our our uh, coho um, management clients and and others who are feeding uh, data. So remember the the um, the early uh, conversation. Uh, was um, it was a bit of a you know there was a the sky is falling uh, element to it you know members will be devastated uh, by the impact of the pandemic they won't be able to uh, meet their their housing charge obligations but here we've got more than half uh, of the almost 60 percent of uh, the respondents saying that their revenue has has uh, remained roughly the same and everyone else said it's fallen by less than uh, than 15 percent uh, we checked in on uh, housing charge collection uh, statistics for April, May, and June. And uh, April was the sketchy month. Uh, we saw about 86 to 87 percent of total housing charge revenue uh, collected. Uh, but in uh, June, uh, across the portfolio, between 96 and 97 percent of co-op homes and uh, almost 97 percent of the of collectible uh, revenue uh, was received by co-op. So, we, we put this down to, um, you know, the culture of uh, responsibility and timely payment uh, that you see in co-ops and also the impact of the government assistance programs that were deployed very quickly and uh, are helping out uh, many members. So good to know uh, that, um, you know, people were actually able to respond to uh, problems or challenges that they knew they had rather than uh, problems that they anticipated uh, might be the case. So if you can see the, the performance in the rental market and even in the nonprofit uh, housing market as distinct from co-ops uh, hasn't been as good. That's partly due to the income uh, mix, I think, in, in, the, in different housing options, but it also um, has to do with the co-op form of tenure. tenure the, you know, the notion that you're an owner a shareholder, so you not only have an obligation um, to look after yourself, but an obligation to look after the association that you own and, and govern. So, a um, bit of good news on on co-op finances. <coughs> there are some co-ops who've um, taken a bit of hit on um, on miscellaneous revenue, uh, like laundry rooms. Um, the response to the fact that there's a lot of uh, touch points uh, in a laundry room, and and that um, you know, maybe that was creating a risk, led some co-ops to uh, suspend uh, coin collection uh, or uh, or payment for laundry during the time of uh, of the pandemic. And, you know, that that is um, a reasonable response in the circumstances, but certainly we didn't see any uh, co-ops that had to take uh, drastic action like housing charge uh, holidays or, or deferrals uh, of housing charge payments. Although, 
um, you know, that still could become uh, a step or a strategy that some co-ops have to take. So we, we I know we've got some uh, information on government uh, assistance, but if there are questions around co-op finances, uh, particularly as it relates to housing charge revenue, we'd be happy to uh, to take them. Yeah, we're getting some comments. Um, I'm not sure if people want to speak it into the meeting. So, um, yeah, so Shannon, Shannon wants to ask a question into the meeting. So I'm just going to unmute you, uh, Shannon. And hopefully that works. Yeah, Hi. It, it, can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Um, we've had, like I said in my earlier question, limited um, stuff come from the board, but the one good thing with our co-op is we are mortgage-free currently, so having that bit more freedom to assist members, um, I think has is, is been fantastic. It was just being you know, a smaller payment going into capital replacement at the end of the year, but just not having to be as, um, as focused on, oh my God, we don't have that revenue coming in, I think it has been a huge um, relief for our members. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and many co-ops are, are in that uh, situation as well. So if you don't have that, you know, that pressing obligation of the monthly debt service, you've got a lot more room uh, to be, um, you know, to be uh, compassionate or, or considerate. The, the big distinction that we heard co-ops debating was uh, do we waive uh, housing charges or do we defer them? And then the big difference there is that deferring a housing charge means that you're still carrying a receivable on your balance sheet. And if it turns out to be practical you know, and realistic to collect those amounts later, uh, then that's good for the co-op and, and good for members uh, as well. There are, we've heard some co-ops, uh, some co-op boards uh, wrestling with the question of whether or not to proceed uh, with a housing charge increase that's already been approved by the members. And if you find yourself in that situation, it's a bit uh, tricky because uh, the board has the authority to approve the budget and to manage the business of the co-op, but the members typically have the authority to approve housing charges. So once the members have given that approval, the board doesn't really have the authority to waive uh, or roll back the increase, but they certainly have discretion in deciding how much of the increase to collect and when to collect it. So we've seen some boards uh, defer uh, the impact of housing charge increases that have been approved by members uh, in advance of going to the members at the next available opportunity at a members meeting and say, you know, ask, you know, do you agree with the decision that we've taken in that regard? Or do you want to revert to the original decision uh, that you made? But it's a good point that debt service obligations uh, or the absence thereof have a huge impact on how flexible you can be in the current circumstances. So, uh, Shannon, your question earlier about the fact that you're, you're no longer on your board, um, but there's been no activity from the board, and what would be the role of, of a co-op member that, that doesn't have that um, responsibility of being a director? Was, is that sort of wrapping up what you were asking? Um, to some degree, we, you know, we received an initial notice at the very beginning, um, the timing was not great. Um, having been a previous board member, I did mention to a couple of board members to say, you know, like having worked with Bell in our office that, you know, there's certain time frames about setting up when housing charges are ready to come out for month end. Um, so the notice came out like the last day of the month. So it would be hard for, you know, for members to deal with that with the office if they couldn't make the next month's housing charge payment for issues. Um, and, you know, and then a smaller point about if you're self-isolating and how to manage that. But we've, it, but there's been nothing since. So it's, it, you don't know, we don't know what's going on um, or what the plan is. So that's been really difficult because, you know, they're not, I don't know, talking the talk, I guess, to, to some degree. And that, that's been difficult for members. I mean, we have a large co-op, we have 75 units. So, mm -hmm. you know, just getting some information, it would be helpful. Yeah, definitely. So, um, yeah, they're, like I said, we're recommending a, 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 that, well, that, that they should have a COVID-19 safety plan and recommend it to the point that it's actually, um, it's actually a, a resolution that's passed on, on the board um, and then getting members on board as, as, to, as to what it is as well. I mean, on the flip side of that is if you've got trades or contractors or people coming to do work at your co-op and there's no signage and members are not respecting the physical distancing, then um, the trade or contractor has the right to refuse work because they feel that it's unsafe. 
So um, there's definitely some responsibility, uh, some leadership needed um, on for any board um, in this case. So um, one more thing, um, um, Shannon, I'm just going to mute you if that's okay, and I'm, I'm going to open it up to, okay, to Pamela. Hi, Pamela. Hello. Um, hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, no worries. We can hear you great. Um, yeah, that's interesting what the other woman was saying. Uh, nobody's been this way before, and our board, too, has floundered a bit, especially in the beginning, as far as we still don't have a, an actual safety plan or anything like that. Um, so there's a learning curve. Probably, I don't know how it is with a lot of other co-ops, but since this is a novel situation, um, it's probably... More, it probably is happening more more than than not. Um, I don't know. Uh, you guys are probably in a better position to be able to say. But um, what I was specifically wondering about was uh, we were going to vote on whether or not to have a uh, um, housing charge rise at the general meeting, which of course wasn't held. And. Right. I'm wondering about the the logistics of that kind of thing. I understand CHFBC is maybe providing assistance in uh, holding general meetings and so on. If I could just throw that out as a really general thing for you to talk at, that would be great. Um, and also, I, I would like to know um, roughly in your experience, how many co-ops do you think do have safety plans and um, how do members motivate boards when it seems that, um, you know, no, not through any fault of their own, but they don't realize just quite what their responsibility in this regard is? Yeah, that, you know, those are really good questions. So, so the easy one is we are going to get in a few minutes uh, to a very concrete discussion about um, board and members meeting assistance. So um, we can we can definitely uh, help you out there. Um, you know, I'm reminded uh, every every time uh, we hear from our provincial health officer, uh, she does remind people to, um, you know, to be safe, but also to be kind. So let's, let's, uh, we can probably agree that not too many people who ran for election to, you know, sit on a co-op board were saying to themselves at the time, I think my biggest contribution to the board um, will be in the event of a global pandemic. <clears throat> because, um, you know, who who saw it coming? Um, no, no one. So it would be understandable uh, if the, you know, if the good people who, who got elected to your board were now sitting around that board table or well, the virtual <laughs> board table asking, what the heck do we do now? Because we're we're really at a loss uh, to understand what our next step might be, and for those directors, I, I would say to them directly, and to you who have been asking as members, what can we do um, about our our, our boards? Um, urge them to reach out for help. Um, you know, on the safety plan issue, it would be a shame if if um, if all 265 nonprofit housing co-ops in BC had to cook up from scratch. 265 uh, health and safety plans. So we're going to, as we come up with them, and, and we have several in hand now, and we'll have more soon. <clears throat> we'll post them as examples on the on the web. It it is a bit tricky because every co-op's a bit different. You know, the housing form, the you know, the way the community is arranged. Um, uh, you know, who the, the the members are. You know, do you have an office or not? Do you have a staff person or, or not? So, but on that site, you'll be able to find a, a, a safety plan that does approximate the circumstances that you find yourself in as a co-op. So we'll make those readily available. And, and I think members have a role to play in saying to the board, look, we don't expect you to be pandemic uh, experts, but we do expect you to reach out for help when you need it. And CHFBC would be a great place to start. And we'll make all of those resources available uh, for the benefit of our member co-ops. <laughs> Okay, great. So Pamela, I'm going to mute you and we're going to move on a little bit. Um, and then um, in a little bit, we'll hear from Avis because um, she's
she was going to share her experience um, at Pioneer as well. But I, I thought it's probably a good idea to, to move on to the government assistance section. Is that you, Tom? Yeah, it, it, I think this can be pretty uh, pretty quick because the the assistance the programs have been well well known. Uh, for you federally uh, funded Section 95 co-ops, you've been waiting. Um, I would say patiently, with infinite patience, for the federal government to announce uh, the extension of the uh, of the Section 95 subsidy programs and co-ops that are within a certain window, you know, of the end of their their agreements are now starting to receive those phase two uh, subsidy agreements. And, you know, because that, that first phase was extended, it was supposed to, to wrap up um, at March 31 uh, of this year. And then it was extended to September. <clears throat> and the, and the, um, <clears throat> the agreements are now starting to arrive for co-ops whose agreements um, have ended and, and, and need to have those agreements replaced in September. The good news, uh, is that the program, the, the the model of the assistance that's being delivered is better than we had been given to expect. And how often have we been able to say that to you uh, about a, a program being administered by, by CMAC? Um, so if, if you do have uh, subsidy uh, surplus funds, it'd be a good time to be uh, to be using them. But the, the approach that CMAC and the federal government have decided to take in that uh, FCHI phase two program is much more flexible, uh, provided that the federal budget holds. Uh, there will be uh, potentially more assistance available uh, as the need uh, either you know, increases or decreases uh, in the co-op. And it promises to, to operate much more like a true rent supplement program, some of the ILM co-ops will, will know uh, what that means, then the, the very limiting uh, subsidy pool approach that you've been used to uh, in the Section 95 program. So, so there's a bit of good news uh, on the federal front. Um, there's more uh, coming on the next slide. Um, you'll see that the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit uh, has been extended. Uh, the government announced that I think literally uh, today or, or, or yesterday, uh, that will be extended. And um, in the event that there are difficulties um, meeting debt service obligations, and, and to be honest, I haven't heard of a single co-op that's had to look for this uh, assistance down this avenue, uh, but uh, CMHC and private lenders are uh, at least making um, noises that they will consider mortgage deferrals if that turns out to be a, a measure of, of, uh, of last resort. Now, there are also provincial uh, programs uh, available. Uh, the uh, BC uh, Temporary Rent Supplement Program uh, was uh, made available to co-op members. That was great news. Um, and many co-op members applied for and, and, uh, those, and, and received those funds, which got deposited straight into co-op um, accounts. Now, June was meant to be the third of three months in that program. It was an April, May, June uh, Temporary Rent Supplement Program. I do know that there's a, a, a debate right now uh, raging in the uh, the legislature, or well, the cabinet office anyway, and treasury board, uh, about whether that temporary rent supplement program needs to be extended uh, beyond June. We don't have any uh, hints about uh, what the answer to that is going to be, but we know it's actively under discussion. And as soon as we know, um, you'll know as well. I don't know if there were were if there was additional uh, information or or slides available uh, under that. Um, I think you muted yourself. Yes, I did mute myself. <laughs> um, no, that was the that was the last of the slides for the government assistance. But uh, we're going on to co-op meetings right now, and um, after the co-op meetings, we'll hear from some members um, that are online. So we'll have a conversation about board meetings and um, members meetings, but I think we had a poll as well to see um, how members are faring in the world of electronic meetings. So let's um, let's see where where you might be at on on that front. So what's your comfort level here? Your co-op is comfortable holding electronic meetings on your own. Um, you could hold them if uh, if you had a little help, 
or you can't uh, can't meet electronically at all. Where where do you where do you come down on that question? Okay, so we'll wrap it up in a few seconds. And um, that's eighty-three percent. And I'll close the poll and share the results. Oh, look at this! Half of you, um, good to go. Uh, one in five, uh, not at all, and about uh, just about a third uh, could do it if you had a little help. So let's chat about this because this I'm keen to hear what your experience has been um, so far and to tell you a bit about the work that we're doing and the experience we're gaining, which has been very um, enlightening, uh, on the meetings that we're being asked to uh, to assist in. And there's a bit of additional information from the government that we can share with you as well. So we'll move on um, to the next couple of slides. Is that another poll, Tom? Or? Uh, no. Nope. I've got this slide and then another poll. That's what's there. No, just roll past that poll. Okay, sure. There we go. Okay, so the first few issues that came up. Um, well, of course, the first thing that that many co-ops noticed. We we discussed this a bit in our last um, get together. Um, was it during the time when it was uh, either impossible or in some cases illegal, depending on the size of your co-op, uh, to get together uh, for a meeting, uh, you were going to hit the uh, deadline uh, for holding an annual meeting. And the, the, um, there have been a number of ministerial orders uh, issued to deal with those questions, and that was the first one. So anybody who uh, had a deadline coming up for an annual meeting had that deadline automatically extended to September 30 uh, to give you a little breathing room to figure out um, how you wanted to proceed. So some cops are saying, well, we're just going to wait. Others were saying we're going to use that uh, breathing room to figure out how to hold meetings uh, on our own. And then you ran into the question of, um, well, do our rules uh, really allow us uh, to have virtual or electronic meetings? And that triggered the second ministerial order because the Co-op Act is pretty permissive, uh, and so are the model rules, uh, for for that matter, around the holding of electronic meetings. So, you know, the stock answer was you can unless your rules prohibit it. And some rules um, created issues, uh, you know, but little ambiguity around whether you were allowed uh, to hold an electronic meeting or not. So the impact of the second ministerial order was to lift uh, all those restrictions, notwithstanding what might appear in your rules um, or, or the act. So, so for the time being, anyway, at least during the state of emergency, which gives you a little bit of time to look at your rules, uh, virtual or electronic meetings are good to go. Now, <clears throat> of course, that raised the issue of, um, you know, can you, should you, do you want to, and what are the issues uh, around um, meeting electronically as opposed to uh, the way you've been used to meeting uh, all along. So <clears throat> the first issue that we've been running into is that not every member understands the, um, you know, the notion of what a meeting is or isn't. Uh, so some co-ops try to fill the gap uh, by doing something that has been a practice, you know, in and around the co-op sector for a while which is to substitute email uh, surveys uh, for meetings. This happens more typically uh, at the board level uh, than it does at the member level. But the, you know, the form it takes uh, would be, you know, the chairperson, uh, <clears throat> I'll pick a simple example, circulates an email to all the directors saying, are you okay with um, the application for membership we've received from so-and-so? Um, let me know if you agree. And as soon as a majority of directors uh, email back, saying, oh yeah, um, no problem, uh, then that was taken to be a valid decision made by the board. Unfortunately, it's not, uh, because it doesn't, um, an email survey is not a meeting. Uh, nobody attended, 
uh, to hear the arguments made for or against the uh, the approval of that uh, application. It wasn't done by what's known as a consent resolution, so there's no signature of every director uh, on a resolution to approve that application, so it simply doesn't count. Now, <clears throat> so that led everyone to the question of, well, what does it really take to, to hold a meeting other than gathering people uh, physically? And the key is, everyone needs to be able to hear everyone else. Uh, and you know, logging into an electronic platform uh, like the one we're on tonight, or phoning into a teleconference facility, or you know, standing at opposite ends of the uh, the common room uh, or the you know the outdoor area and yelling at each other, um, those all count. And in in combination too, it doesn't have to be exclusively one option as against the others. Those all count as attending uh, a meeting. Which of course then raises all bunch of technical questions about uh, well how do you determine who's in attendance um, how, how do you um, establish who's present for the purpose of quorum um, who's going to take the minutes uh, how do you uh, handle members who don't have um, uh, a computer or who don't want to provide an email address to the co-op for the purpose of serving a notice uh, of meeting so I think there's another um, a slide with some of the basic issues that we've been helping um, um, members to deal with, but it does boil down to, you know, some of these simple questions like how do you vote? Um, how do you conduct an election? How do you uh, how do you vote by by secret ballot? <clears throat> Interestingly enough, we have now had inquiries, a formal inquiry from uh, senior policy advisors in the Ministry of Finance, who, having seen the um, you know, the, the way that the, the response to the pandemic has changed the, the governance landscape, if you want to call it that, uh, have been asking questions uh, of us, you know, about uh, your comfort level uh, with holding electronic meetings, uh, whether or not the, the act uh, should be changed to make it more explicitly uh, enabling, you know, around the conduct of virtual or electronic meetings. So we're, we're answering those questions as they come up just based on our experience with with members but so far um, we've been able to develop a platform and and more than one because some members uh, some co-ops were quite happy on a, on a platform like the one we're on tonight <clears throat> others have a marked preference for zoom um, or a combination of a, of a telephone uh, call-in or, or a zoom platform so we're able now to, uh, and we've consulted very carefully with the lawyers uh, who do most of the uh, advising uh, of housing co-ops and, and other co-ops. And we're quite comfortable now uh, that we're in a position to help members and we are actively helping members uh, to hold uh, meetings uh, that are accessible or available to every member, uh, compliant with the rules as they exist and the co-op act and uh, manageable uh, you know for for decision making uh, on a broad uh, community level board meetings are are actually very straightforward members meetings a little more challenging but we're actually doing them <coughs> so it's probably um, the best way to tackle this rather than uh, for me to try and take a guess you know as to what you want to know or, or not uh, is to find out um, what your questions are uh, some of the technical considerations you may uh, be wondering about. And let's just explore this uh, together and, and see what um, what kind of advice you need uh, on what can and can't be done in an electronic meeting format. So I'll, I'll just count on you, Michelle, to um, wrangle the, the questions from here. Okay, so um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unmute uh, Avis because she's talking about her AGM that that hasn't happened, it was supposed to happen in April. So um, Avis, um, you're unmuted. And I think you had a couple points. One is about the AGM and also about the the board, like it's been sort of a silence from your board at Pioneer. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, no worries, we can hear oh, you good, great. Good, good, I wasn't sure if you did or not. Um, mm -hmm. So at Pioneer Co-op, we don't really know what's going on. Um, the members are all questioning, what is going on and, and certainly during the the this pandemic we really want to know what's happening and everything's just been by a, for example uh, they decided 
in March that we would only pay half of our housing charges, um, you know, to help everybody out. And some of us were saying, but we're not going to face um, a drop in income. Like in our household, there is no drop in income. I don't want to pay half of my housing charge. I want to pay the full pop. So some of us just made the decision to make the full housing charge out of principle because there was no need. I would sooner us help our families that may be out of jobs and may not have jobs to go back to because that's the reality we're seeing now. I work as a bookkeeper and I'm seeing that a lot. And um, so I'd like to help my community by saying, you know what, that extra money can go towards those families that maybe don't have the financial resources. Um, the, so, so our board has not been really communicative in terms of what's going on. I know that they've made the decision that nothing was going to occur unless it was an emergency situation. So we don't know what the protocols are. Peter and I are both high risk, as are many of our members. And so if we have to get work done in our unit, how protected are we? How protected are the people coming in? Um, so we don't know. And so it's left things really up in the air here. And it's likely because we have a tired board, they want to have the AGM because we have people coming off the board and until we have our AGM, they're still on the board. <laughs> and um, like, we just, we really don't know what's going on. We're assuming that they're meeting. Um, I'm figuring that they are, but as to whether they are or not, we don't know. Nobody knows what's going on in our co-op. And it's very disheartening for many of us. That's too bad to hear. Tom, any advice for Avis? Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that, uh, Avis. No, I, I, we were aware of a couple of co-ops that uh, took, you know, what we call, call it, thought were were hasty decisions around um, housing charge relief. You know, I hesitate to be too critical about people because I'm sure they thought they were doing uh, the right the right thing for the members. But but uh, I agree with you. It's always better to wait until you're sure you have a problem so that you can uh, you can deal with it uh, effectively. Um, if if you know the board is tired. Uh, I mean, I get that. That's that's um, that's a pretty common feeling uh, these days. Uh, but it doesn't relieve the the board or the co-op from the obligation to think forward to the time when it needs to have that uh, annual meeting. So if it will help, um, you know, for any of the directors to reach out to us or for us to reach out to them, um, we are now confident uh, that annual meetings and other meetings can be held um, within the the guidelines set out in the ministerial orders and, and the act and we have the platform uh, that we can make available to co-ops to plug into or or to show them how to use their own uh, platforms I, I think the um, what we quickly realized was that, that some co-ops will want us to, to help them hold the meetings others will just want us to show them how to do it on their own and we're prepared to do both but uh, you know I can assure you that uh, it's doable um, many co-ops are actually finding that it's a bit of a community builder. Uh, it seems odd that that uh, you know because everybody's separated, right, uh, physically, uh, by the requirements of the you know physical distancing and 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 the uh, you know some of the restrictions on the economy we've seen. But once everyone figures out that they they can um, meet, you know, their 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 neighbors, their fellow shareholders uh, online. Um, that they don't have to show up in a hall um, where you know they may in the past have had difficulties uh, getting to or or uh, or you know sitting in. Um, many co-ops are telling us that they've never had such um, such participation uh, or such engagement uh, from their members. It's all a question of getting used to something new or different. And then you know the electronic platform is is a bit of a um, a system shock for some people who've never used it, but people uh, acclimate to it very, very quickly. And once you learn how to, you know, use the tools and pull the levers on it, uh, we, you know, and, and we're, as I said, we're perfectly happy to help in that. Uh, it can lead to quite a rewarding uh, experience and one that I think um, co-ops are going to opt for, even when they're not obliged to, you know, after whatever, you know, whatever new normal uh, turns out to be, uh, we think this is going to be a permanent part of the co-op governance landscape, and we look forward to being of assistance to our members in helping. Very good. Great. Thanks for, thanks for your question, uh, Avis. I'm just going to mute you, and um, I'm going to mute. There's a couple questions out there. Uh, Carolyn has been waiting for a bit to ask her question, and um, 
Carolyn, I can't unmute you because you've mute, you've self muted, so you're going to have to unmute yourself, and um, you can ask the question. There you go. Okay. Boy, that was a bit of a delay compared to Zoom, but anyway, um, <laughs> I checked the thing about 15 seconds before that. Um, so my question actually more related to the poll in terms of. Mm -hmm. I don't need any assistance in terms of doing the board meetings. All the board members have made themselves sort of electronically able to participate. And we have one member who has a Zoom account. So she actually tends to, now maybe this is a question, okay, so she's not on the board anymore. She used to be, but she sort of just sets us all up, makes one of us, makes the chair the host, and then leaves the room kind of thing. <laughs> so, and hopefully that's okay because she's been doing that we've asked her to do that she's been doing that um so for the board not a problem but i think we maybe have we're we are in a situation where we do need to have a general meeting and so anyway my question had to do with that poll in terms of trying to answer that poll are you talking about general meetings or board meetings no assistance required for board meetings but i think we might need some for a general meeting which is going to be necessary shortly for refinancing purposes and end of operating agreement and all that yeah, I think you're you're um that's a good distinction. I I, I should have um made it earlier. I think you're right that board meetings are much less uh, of a problem. Um because some of the low tech uh solutions that are available uh will suffice uh, quite you know quite well uh for board meetings. The 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 system you've described where somebody makes the host platform available um and and just um exits the meeting I, I don't see a, a, a problem in that at all and, and it's you're lucky um, that that's available to you and that people are comfortable uh, in that setting and they can meet but you're right that they're they're more uh, more complex issues not not um, insurmountable by any stretch but certainly more complex issues uh, that come with the members meeting so it's pretty easy to tell at a board meeting who's there and who's not um, you know, the average board has seven directors. Pretty easy to tell if you've got seven or six or five on the line. Quorum, it's a snap to figure out. Um, members meetings, a little trickier because now you're into questions about the right of access, mm -hmm. right? Um, you can make the platform widely available to members, but every member has a right to attend and to vote on any matter of business that comes before the members. And if a member says, you know, I'm not comfortable giving you my email address and or I don't have a computer or I don't have a reliable internet connection. I need you to give me another option uh, mm -hmm. to exercise my franchise as a member. And that's where you, know, you need then now you're juggling <clears throat> uh, different forms of participation. You've got, say, 40 people on your Zoom platform. You've got five people who decided to phone in and you've got two people who said, I'll, I'll take nothing less than being able to show up, um, you know, down in the garage or in the meeting room with all of the physical distancing um, protocols in place. And that's how I want to participate. So <clears throat> once you unpack that, you realize that it's just really a question of answering each of those technical questions as they as they come up. Um, who's there uh, for quorum? How do you take a vote? The, the, the Zoom poll. Uh, that or that or the go to webinar poll that you um, <clears throat> that you practiced uh, tonight is one way of conducting uh, a vote at a members meeting. Um, the answer so instead of a multiple choice question like you saw, you have the resolution at the top and the only two choices well the three choices are yes, no, and abstain, and the you know the program will will pop out those results if people. Um, and, and and fairly easily because it gives you a percentage uh, okay. allow you to calculate whether or not you have the, the majority. Sorry, Tom, does it record that result so that that can become part of the minute? Uh, the minute taker will um, will want to, to pay attention, but you can use the record uh, function of the uh, platform as well uh, okay. to to record the, the result. Okay. And then, you know, the, the real, um, the tricky pieces uh, are, you know, an election at an AGM or a question where one or more members, whatever's required under the rules, requests a, a secret ballot. 
that takes a bit of a different, uh, that's a bolt-on or an add-on to the software platform. Uh, we've tested a couple of them now, and then uh, they work uh, pretty well, and we're happy to help co-ops uh, you know, learn how to attach those to the platforms that they use. Um, so there's nothing, um, I guess the, the, the short conclusion that, that I want to share is that there's, we haven't found anything that would normally occur at a members meeting of any kind, including an AGM with an election, that can't be accomplished online uh, with the right kind of facilitation, the right kind of hosting uh, assistance. So we're, and again, we're happy to, um, to help. Great, thanks. Thanks, Carolyn. I'm going to mute you now. Um, so just some comments out there. I do think you answered the question, Tom, from Pamela. Um, she's at a 55 uh, plus co-op and again, not computer sophisticated. And um, what sort of what can they do to, to, to get to their members to attend meetings? How do we include them when they often don't have an email? So um, I think you sort of answered that question. Um, yeah, it's a combination of platforms that you have to use um, and people can call in. Um, we've even had some co-ops where they've had a secret ballot in the common room and it's been guarded by somebody and people can walk in and, and vote if they're not able to vote online. So I don't know if you have anything else you want to add to that. Well, just that, you know, it's wise to check with your members to see what they're comfortable with. I've, I've been surprised at the, uh, the level of... Um, uh, computer savviness in some of the senior um, uh, populations because um, seniors uh, keep in, they want to keep in touch with their grandkids and um, yeah. the way you, the way you do that is by uh, figuring out how how you know that can be done online so there's there's a level of uh, sophistication there that will sometimes surprise you but it's you know you're right that that in the event that that's simply not an option uh, then you need to explore um, other other options the the you know the next level down is the good old um you know teleconference you know the 1-800 number and everybody um can hear everyone else but they're on the phone and that's a perfectly legitimate way to hold a meeting a little more um a few more challenges involved in, in uh, you know taking votes and that but a vote by a roll call um, it's it's good enough for the House of Commons, so it's uh, it's also good enough for a, a co-op meeting that can easily be be done. If if all you're left with uh, is a physical meeting, that is going to be a problem, um, given the you know the distancing regulations, especially a larger co-op where it's actually contrary to a public health order to have gatherings of more than 50 people. Um, that's going to be a challenge. What you can't do, I, I got a call from a or an email from a co-op, not on the island, um, who said that that um, it was a co-op with something like 65 uh, voting members. And uh, they'd figured out that their common room could hold 18. And that would be the max, uh, given the distancing protocols and, you know, the safe, a safe, um, have a safely conducted meeting. So what they decided to do, and quorum was, um, 16, I believe. So they they issued a notice to members saying the first 18 people who show up at the meeting hall will get to participate in the meeting and the rest of you are out of luck. Uh, sorry. And and um, that's simply not okay uh, because that's that's the denying members who are who have a um, a legally guaranteed right under the act uh, to vote denying them the opportunity to exercise their vote. So that's not going to fly. So if you're faced with a situation in which people say, the only way I can participate in a meeting is if I do so in person, then you're going to have to do a quick calculation about whether that's even going to be possible uh, in the co-op. Maybe you can accommodate that group as long as it's not bigger than the guidelines will allow and move everybody else online or onto the phone. But I'd urge anybody who's who's wrestling with a kind of a unique uh, situation like that to give us a call, and uh, and we'll try to help you work it through. Thanks, Tom. So the the next question is from Pamela. She um, she's on a committee, and they have a member engagement project, so they want to do it via um, online um, a sort of information meeting, town hall. So um, what any advice that you have for conducting that? 
only that it, it can be done and it can be done um, really, uh, really quite well. So I know this because our community land trust team yeah. uh, had a co-op cafe session uh, with James Bay co-op. Uh, very Great. recently, too, too, in fact. Mm -hmm. And I've heard nothing but rave uh, reviews um, of it. Uh, I've seen it work in a couple of other uh, settings too, with uh, new uh, the new Fraser View Housing Co-op. And and I, I don't actually know the um, the name of the platform, but I would encourage you to, if you're interested in this, um, get in touch with us. And we'll plug you in uh, to the people who who run those sessions. But literally. Uh, they have, you know, electronic uh, flip charts, uh, post-it notes. People are writing things on flip charts and moving them around you know, the screen. It's a, it's a, like a virtual whiteboard, uh, but it's designed to uh, create a very dynamic, a very interactive conversation among a group of members. So, I, you know, confess I was a bit skeptical um, when I heard that we were going to do it. So I thought, how, how can you, like, reproduce? some of the really dynamic events that we've seen happen in co-op meeting rooms and common rooms uh, online. And, you know, they did. So anything along those lines can be done. The, the technology is expanding and evolving at a very, very rapid pace. And uh, a lot of it is very uh, user friendly. So I'd be happy to plug anyone who wants to learn more about that um, into um, you know, a conversation with some of our community land trust people or uh, check out um, check it out with the folks at James Bay Co-op and uh, see uh, see how they found it. Um, and just to clarify, there's no quorum needed for a town hall because it's just an info session, right? That's right. Uh, it, in fact, I'd encourage people not to use the word meeting uh, yeah. unless you have business to transact. Uh, you can get people together in an information session, a town hall, uh, anything. Uh, call it call it a, a, a fish or a bicycle. Just don't don't use the word meeting because that raises issues around what the notice is, what the quorum is, um, you know, what the voting requirements are. Um, you can get a lot. You can, a lot of the conversations that happen in co-ops uh, aren't around the transaction of business. If you, if you you know think back to the last um, you know five members meetings you went to. And ask yourself, or go look at the minutes. You know what actual business was transacted, and how much of the meeting was really members sharing views, getting information, uh, making their views known. And that can be done in a in a forum and 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 according to rules that have nothing to do with the rules of order that you would normally uh, employ at a members meeting. So I'd encourage you to you know, think uh, flexibly about um, what's possible uh, and how to get people together to you know to the benefit of the community. Great, and just to add to that response about the, the CLT's platform, um, a, a much simpler one as well is, is Zoom. With, with Zoom, you are able to use a whiteboard. Um, you are able to go into uh, breakout rooms and, and have discussions and then bring everybody back into the room again. We use it quite successfully for any sort of staff training that we've been doing online. So um, that's a much simpler version, but definitely the, the, the CLT um, exercise with um, with James Bay was was incredible and um, very interactive. So I, I noticed that Pamela said that she's going to reach out to James Bay. So that that's great. I think you know the the mistake that some of us might be making is to think, well, <clears throat> we're just going to hold on. Uh, you know, this too shall pass, and and indeed it will. Um, but what we don't know is what what things are going to look like um, beyond. You know that first passing. There, there's, and boy, I'm I'm the furthest away from uh, an epidemiologist that you could imagine. But I, you know, I have done some reading now, and I know that there's it's always a first, right? First time for everything. But there's never been a pandemic in recorded human history that did not have a very um, uh, viral uh, second wave. And and uh, so. If you follow the science, you know the answer to, or the question that should be asked is not if, but when. And what will, you know, how ferocious will it be? Maybe it'll be, you know, nothing, but maybe it'll be something. And I think that some of the questions that people are asking around governance, around community, around meetings, are going to be um, kind of a semi-permanent part of our landscape. So just kind of waiting to see uh, is probably not the optimal strategy. We should be um, 
a little more proactive about that and ask ourselves what steps we can take now uh, to put those systems in place that will help us govern our communities um, in the years to come. Thank you. And Ava says that she agrees with you. She actually said it twice in writing. Uh, the first one about the um, um, the 55 plus being tech, very tech tech savvy, and also I guess about um, not postponing to just try and find another way through it all. If you so could send we're going to move along. Of that, what, that would be. If you could send me written confirmation of Avis's admission, that would be great. <laughs> it's in writing, so we got it. <laughs> okay, so shall we move along? Um, looks like you have another poll, or there could be. Let's uh, let's find out. I forget what it is. <laughs> I know, that's so funny. Uh, let's try this one. Um, what has the impact of COVID-19 been on your community? Uh, so we're gonna launch it. Yeah, I'm just curious, because I've been hearing so many different stories about this. So um, has this brought your community closer together? Uh, has it created more divisions? Um, has it had no impact at all? Uh, Co-op model is pretty resilient. Um, and different co-ops are experiencing this in different ways. So let's uh, hear from you on this. Okay, so um, <laughs> you're gonna be, um, <laughs> I'm gonna share the, the results. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, <there> <laughs> that's about as, allowing for a margin of error, that's about as, uh, as uh, even a split as you can imagine, right? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, let's, so the silver lining here is a third of the people who responded, uh, almost a third, thought that this had um, brought the community closer together. Um, you know, 40% say it's created divisions and this is understandable, right? Because this is a very stressful time. I, I'm having to remind myself all the time that the person you're talking to um, who might be giving you a bit of a hard time or you're having trouble getting your point of view across to um, may be experiencing this entire situation in a way that's introducing uh, considerable stress uh, into their lives, whether it be professional or personal. And, uh, you know, we all do have to take uh, the doctor's advice and you know, be safe, be kind, and, and extend the benefit of the doubt. But um, the solution is not going to be uh, to do nothing or to wait and see what happens. So, you know, if, if there are those divisions emerging, um, don't expect them just to um, get papered over or dissolve. Um, reach out, uh, do something about them. And again, if you can think of any way we can help, uh, we're happy to do so. Okay. Um, I guess. Carolyn's comment, I'll just read it into the meeting, is that divisions hadn't be, been created, but they are missing their, their potluck summer barbecues, weekly potluck summer barbecues. So, um, okay, so I'll get Fiona to you to talk about CHSBC services. Great, okay, so I'm back here and I'm just gonna try and see the slides a little better. Yes, so CHSBC, services we're here to help you you can always contact us members at chf.bc.ca but i want to let you know about something pretty exciting uh, that you might have heard about whispers about and it's we're calling it buddy up that's the name of this platform that we are getting to try out uh, for all chfbc members and what it is is a sharing platform where, where people can um, make requests uh, make offers or share ideas, and it's a uh, this is between housing co-ops. So, and it can be things that are from you know you sell you have a service and you want to sell it, or it could be hey I've got this thing I'm trying to give away or that kind of thing. And we're thinking it might be a really great thing, especially I mean the timing of it. We heard about Buddy Up before the COVID nineteen crisis came upon us, but the timing is really good for a platform like this uh, where a lot of people can't connect in the usual kinds of ways to go online and you know, offer things to other people in other housing co-ops all over the province or just in your community. So um, we've just sort of soft launched it to a few staff and now we, and a few people who live in housing co-ops, but not the entire membership. And now we wanna offer a launch to island members only for the next week or so. Uh, and 
next slide, I can show you where you go. We haven't put it up publicly, but you can find this. If you go to this page, it's chfbc, chf.bc.ca backslash connecting dash cooperators with a hyphen backslash. It'll get you to the, the landing page that shows you, you have to read all our disclaimers and stuff and it'll tell you the password. And then you can enter the next page where you'll see a lot of stuff, but it's something like this, where you can view existing postings and there's a place below that where you can post things. Um, anyway, we just really wanna see uh, some members actually using it, trying it out and let us know what you think about it. Um, and that's, I think my next slide is just reminding you to make sure to please do try it out. Um, if you have any questions now, or you just wanna give us feedback, uh, you can always reach any of us at members at chf.bc.ca and uh, let us know what you think. Um, and we will send it out um, via e-news to island members and try to get it out just to all the island contacts we have so that lots of you can try it out for a, a week or or maybe a bit longer. Um, so Thanks, Fiona. Um, so the, yeah, yeah, so the, the, there's some questions about Buddy Up. Everyone seems okay. pretty excited about it, so they wanted yeah. to make sure that um, some people I know that have used it, uh, for example, would be to, um, for grocery shopping, like I'm going grocery, so you've got a co-op, uh, you've got your co-op, and it's like, okay, I'm going grocery shopping, and um, sharing that service with your co-op members so that they can pick something up or, you know, that sort of thing. That's that's kind of the platform. Mm -hmm. uh, it is different from Facebook. It's one of the questions that, that's asking about that, because you're sort of tagging a service, right? So you know, like uh, carpool ride or grocery shopping or um, or movie movie night, those kinds of things. I mean, a lot of co-ops are doing, I know Carolyn was talking about uh, missing the, the weekly potluck, but a lot of co-ops are actually doing uh, Zoom concerts and uh, playing something from live from YouTube on Zoom and having everybody at the co-op log on and watch it or movies as well. Movie nights they're doing, they're also doing to get together for dinner, even online right and, and doing those kinds of things so it's just about doing creative ways to get your community together so the weekly potluck is going to look a little bit different uh, but um, it'll be online but those are the kinds of things this is the kind of platform that that Fiona is is talking about uh, for for this kind of thing right Fiona any yes. other ideas of how to use it because it's different from Facebook it's yeah not, so it's, I mean yeah. not every not everyone's comfortable on Facebook. Not everybody wants to use Facebook. Um, it's not like you have to have a profile and a whole bunch of stuff about yourself. Um, you can be pretty um, minimal in what you say about you. It's more about the offer and the and the request. Um, I know of, um, this isn't on there right now, but there was a, a gentleman at a co-op in Vancouver that reached out to us because he had all this bread that he usually delivered to certain charities and stuff and he had nowhere to take it. He, he just wanted to know, oh, I'm in a co-op, what other co-ops around in my neighborhood that would want this bread? So we had to try to connect him. So if he had had this platform, he could have put it up there. Hey, I've got you know fresh bread to donate from a bakery or whatever it was. So I think that's like an obvious one, but I think there, that what Michelle's saying is really unique. You could have a party, you could invite all your neighboring co-ops to connect. Maybe you'll be connecting more than, than we ordinarily do, you know? Um, so, Sky's the limit. So I, yeah. I, I, yeah, I backed up the slide a little bit because there were some yeah. questions about sure. the, the link, and um, and you will be sending it out as well. So I just left the link up a yes. little bit longer. Yeah. Um, so. Um, yeah. Um, and so, um, do you want to talk about? Sure. CHFBC? So as yeah. you know, most of you are very familiar that we have a lot of services at CHFBC, and I'm just going to tell you about where we're at with all of them right now. So. Education, I think, is my next slide. Uh, it's still underway. You want to switch slide? There, yeah. So obviously, everything education-wise is being done in a virtual sense. Um, we're doing webinars. You can check our website. There's lots of them up there. But even consultations, um, you know, board consultations, chairing of meetings, um, portable workshops. Those kind of requests have been coming in, and we're we're doing what we can. That's why. Uh, Tom is very confident about how we know to use the software because there's a lot of that going on right now. Our staff have <clears throat> switched over to offering everything virtually. Um, so yeah, please, and if you have ideas for things you'd like to see on the island, uh, not on the island, but <laughs> for island members or for anyone in housing co-ops, please let us know. We'd be really interested to hear. 
Okay, next slide is group buying. So um, as you know, group group buying is the one of the kind of bread and butter uh, membership benefits. And so here's the latest. Uh, Trail Appliances is doing in-suite delivery and Holloway services, but all of these, any of these organizations are doing them under the current level of restrictions and guidelines, um, and often with permission uh, from a member, with the kind of thing that Michelle was outlining about, you know, a questionnaire, uh, you know, is it safe for them to go in, or and also is the member comfortable, or will the member need to leave for them to come in, that kind of stuff. Um, telecom program with TELUS has been all along doing new signups and speed upgrades. Um, and now the ones where there were some troubles before with uh, where, you, where a technician did need to come in, they weren't going in, but now they are going in with permission. Um, island flooring. Now at your last, cast your mind way back to the last Island Council meeting, uh, Island flooring was there, I understand, and offered a $200 discount to anyone to use their products. They've extended that discount to July 31st, so you can use that. They are also following the same guidelines if they needed to do installations. CHIP program, everybody, the you know interest rates have been hit uh, all over the place, and uh, CHIP is no exception, but being part of a pool has been a bit of a buffer, so you know it's better than the, the, the other options out there right now. Um, Rona, as you heard from uh, Brad, and I can tell you his email address. If anybody wants to grab a pen, it's, and I can also try to send this out to anyone who was at the, that was here today at the town hall. It's brad.legro, L-E-G-R-O-W, at rona, R-O-N-A, dot C-A. So um, you can contact him. and. What he was saying, uh, yeah, the Lowe's program does sound pretty exciting. It's going to be a new kind of program. I've heard that it's coming really soon. So as soon as we know more, we'll be sending that out in an e-news to all island members. And anybody who's getting their waste and recycling with GFL Environmental, it's been, service has been the same all the way through. Uh, and they've also been doing a lot of, I understand, yard waste bins for co-ops that are getting in and doing that kind of work, a lot of yard work and uh, cleanups. So I think that's it. Any questions about group buying? Um, no. And of course, there's lots more that we do. Um, advocacy, we've been working with leasehold co-ops. We've been advocating to the government for all of, uh, you know, making sure that housing co-ops were able to take advantage of the rent supplement. Some of the other things that Tom was mentioning. Um, for about virtual meetings, making sure that was uh, a, that was changed. Planning and renewal team is still doing uh, what it can to help co-ops get their building condition assessments, get financing, following it, safety precautions, and you can reach out to them at renewal at chf.bc.ca. And anything else, like I said before, um, we've just felt like more than ever, we're really connecting on members at chf.bc.ca. We're all work, working remotely still, and um, there's a team of us checking out those those emails that come in, so contact us. And for wrap up, what are we saying in our wrap up? There is, we really um, wanna make yeah, sure. Look up, yeah, go ahead, A couple Michelle. questions out there. Okay, so so um, yeah. I, I don't know if Tom's on, on the line, but, um, so uh, Fiona, a little bit of uh, a comment about the the Google return on the page that was sent. So um, can we assume that um, when we're going to send out surveys for tonight's event, we have everyone's email address. We can send them Brad's email address. We can send them the link and the path. And is also asking, I think the password is password, isn't it? Um, we're not, I'm not going to tell it? you the password because we want you to read oh, the disclaimer memory. before you read the password. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so there, obviously, there's issues uh, with yeah. privacy and what what you can and what you should and shouldn't use the buddy yeah. up for. So there is a disclaimer carefully written by our our legal eagle. Yeah. So um, yeah. Okay. And question uh, is about the chip rate. Um, I just want to know what the chip rate is. It I forget. Is it point I don't, seven I or no? Point. It's uh, yeah. seven, seventy basis points. Yep. <laughs> seventy. And, uh, yep. yep. On a Van City account, the um, the posted rate on a checking account for a non-member is uh, is 10 basis points, so point, um, 10 percent of one percent, um, whereas it's uh, seven seven tenths of a percent uh, in the in the Van City program. Hoping um, 
uh, the CHIP program is the only uh, service I'm aware of that has people praying for higher interest rates. Uh, and, and we will, uh, you know, we have seen the CHIP rate uh, up over two and a half percent, but uh, three successive uh, surprise reductions by the Bank of Canada in the benchmark interest rate, of course, uh, produced as a chain reaction, similar reductions uh, on interest rates posted by participating credit unions. So that's, um, uh, but still, still a better uh, rate than um, is available to non-members. Yep. Great. I think that's all the questions that we had. Um, uh, if there's anybody that wants to say something um, into the meeting, please um, put, indicate that in the question box that you've been doing that. Uh, all, all along, but uh, now we have a poll of six, I think. Um, um, did you want to talk about that one when the pandemic is over? Yeah, just uh, let's uh, let's see how optimistic uh, you are, especially, you know, given the kinds of conversations uh, that we've had uh, tonight and, and other nights. Um, let's uh, let's have a look at your your options here on this poll. <clears throat> so when it's finally over, um, whenever that is, um, we'll be stronger than ever weaker than we once were, or we won't notice any difference. This is just a test of your optimism level. Okay, so we will close the poll. And another interesting um, result. Oh, there we go. So, no one thinks we are are going to be weaker. <clears throat> half of you think that we'll be exactly as we are now, and the other half uh, stronger than ever. And that's certainly uh, what we're working toward. This, by the way, uh, is another example of a, of the way you would structure a, a vote uh, at a members meeting uh, using this uh, kind of poll technique. Because you can see there are three options, right? So, if instead of um, stronger than ever, weaker than we once were, or won't notice any difference, uh, you substituted uh, in favor, opposed, or abstain, or yes, no abstain, um, you would be able to see on the screen in front of you uh, the result of, of that vote. So that's an, uh, you know just another example of how you can take the technology available and use it um, to reproduce the same decisions that you would make, uh, but in a virtual uh, platform. Okay, thank you. So I'm wondering who is speaking to the final slide, but a lot of thank yous from the um, from the group. Uh, Shannon's asking how many uh, people were on board. We have 12 attendees from the Vancouver Island um, that uh, Vancouver Island members are that have tonight. And I hope that answers your question, Shannon. And upcoming events. I think the next slide is upcoming events. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so we have a, a we're going to be awarding three scholarships to um, three co-op applicants, successful applicants in our scholarship program. It's continuing, and usually we give out those awards at our semi-annual general meeting. This time it's going to be a vir virtual award ceremony. If you'd like to watch it, just go to our um, web our event listing, and you'll see a link to join in. It's a I think it's a, going to be a a Zoom meeting, so you just have to register for that. Uh, and of course, the exciting thing that you all on the island want to know about is the Vancouver Island Council meeting, which will be Thursday, July 2nd. So. Or, or not. Uh, or we, not. We, yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> okay. Stay tuned on this one. We, we've, um, we've had a couple of comments uh, from island folks that uh, this is perhaps uh, a bit too cozy on the calendar with the July 1 uh, stat holiday and people won't be back in the swing of things uh, uh, that soon. So I think that we will uh, have a look at our calendar and rearrange this to make it uh, a little easier or more comfortable for you to plug in. The, 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 the other, you know, the great thing about um, virtual platforms is that we don't have to phone a hotel and find out if they have a room available on a different night. Um, we're the room. So uh, we can make it happen anytime it's convenient for you. And uh, we'll definitely take that feedback to heart and, and uh, have a look at that schedule. 
Yeah, and if you've already registered, we'll definitely notify you of the new date, should it change. Okay, um, so a lot of thank you from the from the group um, and um, our chair of Vancouver Island Council thinks that everything would be any night other than a Thursday would be her preference. Okay. Okay. And um, and also some feedback from some of the um, some of the the attendees about loving virtual education sessions. Mm. Um, so just a reminder about uh, the resources that are out there. Yes, yes. And uh, Debbie, you're there. Thank you very much for yes. supporting the event. Thank you. Um, <laughs> no if, you don't, if you don't do what you do, uh, this doesn't happen. So thanks again for your help. No problem, anytime. Okay, guys, uh, thanks okay. for coming out. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye. Good night, everyone. Good night.